So, Dinaway Magani Duk, that's greetings, my relatives in, in Ojibwe. Uh, thank you for joining us today for um, our monthly webinar in, in our series. Um, and this month we have um, Dr. Brenda Child joining us, and I'll introduce her in a second. Uh, just want to go over some logistics first about uh, the format. If you haven't joined us before for one of our webinars, you should have a uh, panel to the right side of your computer screen that allows you to um, set up your view if you want to be viewing our PowerPoint slideshow alone or if you want to be able to see our lovely smiling faces, um, if you want to minimize any of that or if you want them to be equal size, uh, you should be able to set up your configuration there. Everybody is in listen only mode. So um, when we do have Q&A, the um, chat feature um, will be how you can ask questions. I do believe that um, Brenda will We'll try to um, stop midway to, to answer questions for the first half of her talk, but we'll leave that up to her. So feel free to enter those questions as as she's going through her talk. And um, yeah, I think we did not set up a poll to ask who is on the webinar today, um, but if you want to go ahead and um, and send us in a chat, say hi, tell us where you're from, who you are. Um, we'd love to we'd love to see who's out there today. Okay, so um, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is is proud to host this series, and we're super grateful for uh, Brenda Child to be joining us, Dr. Dr. Child. And uh, NABS is a 501c3 nonprofit that was formed to address the, and understand the ongoing impacts of boarding school in, um, trauma in this country. And we are a membership organization. It's free for anyone to join. And um, we also have tribes and, and native and non-native organizations that are part of the coalition. Our mission is to lead in the pursuit of understanding and addressing that ongoing trauma that was created by the Indian boarding school policies. So we focus our programs around education, advocacy, and healing. We um, have plenty of resources on our website, uh, boardingschoolhealing.org. So if you haven't checked that out, go ahead and um, and do that. And um, now I will introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Brenda Child is Red Lake Ojibwe, and she is the Northrop Professor and Chair of the Department of American Studies and the former Chair of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. She received her PhD in history at the University of Iowa. She has written books uh, titled Boarding School Seasons and American Indian Families, uh, Holding Our World Together, Ojibwe Women and Their Survival Community, Indian Subjects, Hemispheric Perspectives on the History of Indigenous Education, My Grandfather's Knocking Sticks, Ojibwe Family Life and Labor on the Reservation, and one of my personal favorites, Bow Wow Pow Wow. Um, she was an original consultant to the exhibit Remembering Our Indian School Days at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, and co-author of the book that accompanied the reopening of the and the update of that exhibit away from home. Um, Dr. Child is writing a new book currently that should be coming out hopefully soon, The Marriage Blanket, Citizenship, Violence, and American Indian Families in the Reservation Era. Thank you, Dr. Child, for being with us today. I'll hand it over to you now. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this um, webinar, which seems uh, a technological miracle to me and just uh, so amazing that we can kind of broadcast out uh, to so many people and they can tune in um, to this uh, presentation today. So, um, just to kind of get started, Anin, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want, I guess I, what I did, decided to do today, and it'll take me a little while to warm up my thoughts here, but um, I wanted to talk about this idea of boarding school generations. And uh, remember, as I uh, kind of give my presentation today, that I am a, uh, a historian who has kind of written about this topic um, from the perspective of American Indian history. And I began working on this project quite a long time ago. It really was my own dissertation 
um, project when I was in graduate school. And this was, I often tell my students, kind of a different era in America, thinking about American Indian history in that there was no course in American Indian history at the university that I attended for graduate school. And there had not been a lot of literature at that time about the history of American Indians and government boarding schools. And what was out there really was written from the perspective of policymakers and reformers. And it really didn't do much to address the experience from the perspective of native people. And I'm kind of very happy to have been part of uh, what I, I sort of um, think of it as, as a first wave of literature about the history of American Indian education. So um, this is my book, Boarding School Seasons, uh, that's been around for over 20 years. Um, I'm you know, very proud of the work that went into that book, especially because it was so inspired by my own grandmother who had been a student uh, at the Flandreau Indian School in South Dakota in the 1920s. And in my family, we have a long uh, kind of history with government federal boarding schools in that um, my grandfather had been a student at the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, my grandma's dad. And in fact, the first time I saw his handwriting was actually in the National Archives when he was writing to the Flandreau School um, asking that my grandmother uh, come home from school. And that was, so it's um, something that I've studied as a scholar and as a historian, but I also have um, a very deep family history uh, with government boarding schools. Now, at the time I was in graduate school in the, um, I finished my PhD, you know, it was sort of like in the 80s and the early 90s when I actually finished my PhD. But um, at that time, it was, there, there were still elders around um, Red Lake who had been um, to boarding school that were kind of contemporaries of my grandmother. In fact, my grandmother was alive in her 80s when I was in graduate school as well. And they were kind of, to me, a wonderful source of uh, questions, but also um, a wonderful source of uh, kind of inspiration for this project. Many of those people have, of course, now in the intervening years passed away. And as a historian, I want to talk to you today about government boarding schools and their history in the late 19th and early 20th century, because historians tend to periodize the boarding school era. And we're talking about when the federal schools were created and when the policy shifted in the United States to public school education for American Indians. Um, and so I tend to look at this topic um, from starting around 1879, which is when the Carlisle School was established. Of course, there were some Indians who attended mission schools and the Hampton Institute and other institutions before, uh, prior to Carlisle, but we generally periodized the eras beginning in 1879. And then in the 1930s in the United States, when FDR was president, the government had been for many years turning away from the policy of educating native people in off-reservation boarding schools. In some ways that policy wasn't realized for a number of years. And so there were still government boarding schools that operated in the 1930s. But it's important to keep in mind that the federal government was trying to shut down the schools. And this is what um, Commissioner John Collier wanted to do. He called boarding schools um, medieval institutions from the dark ages. He was not a fan in any way of government boarding schools. And so you have a new era. Now, um, and so we, I do talk about boarding schools and I'll talk about them today through the 1930s because I think that Great Depression generation is, is very important. But remember that Historians generally periodize the height of the assimilation campaign in the United States as um, beginning in the 19th century and lasting, really declining under FDR when ideas had changed and um, the boarding school was sort of an obsolete institution. So remember, again, with my conversation today, I'm focusing on the federal schools and not mission schools um, that were run by church organizations. And I myself have never um, studied the history of 
mission schools and church organizations. But I have looked quite a bit at the history of government boarding schools and tried to do that from the perspective as much as I could of American Indian students, American Indian children and families and from the perspective of the community. So I'll give you just a few key words that I wanna um, talk about today. One of them is very familiar to people who, um, you know, who think about educational history in the context of American history. And that word is segregation. It's not one that we use a lot um, in talking about boarding school history, but I'm going to argue for its usefulness in thinking about American Indian history. So segregation is another word. Of course, my other title is generations, or my other key word, because I think that we should think of, um, you know, historians are interested in, in change and, and how our lives changed. And, and today I'm gonna talk about this half century of Indian assimilation and how we should think about boarding school history in terms of generations. So that's another idea. And then I might pause when we're done with those first two topics and ask if you have any questions before I end up on the last topic that has sort of um, actually engaged me for a number of years after I published boarding school seasons and continue to ponder it and give public talks about it and um, answer a lot of questions from native people and hear their questions as well and their comments on this history and what it has meant to them. And so that other uh, term is historical memory, which is just how do we remember boarding schools today? How do we remember and recall that history, which may be in some ways different from the history itself. Historians tell us that um, memory is sort of a changing landscape and that we may, our present generation remember boarding school differently than our grandparents or our great grandparents. But I wanna talk a little bit about how I see American Indian people remembering boarding school history. So historical memory is another kind of key term. So viewed, for, viewed through the lens of America's racial past, Indian boarding schools are generally not acknowledged as part of our history of segregated schooling. And for the most part, it's been a history largely ignored by US historians. But if you think about it, Indian boarding schools were a unique form of segregated education to emerge in the history of the US. And like other forms of segregation, um, serve the interests of a white majority. At the time the schools were first designed, reformers and politicians agreed that Indian men, women, and children, but particularly children, must adopt values of individualism, become citizens, and also pursue agricultural or industrial labor. This assessment of indigenous societies was politically motivated by the allotment of Indian reservations and guided by the ongoing principle in American political and economic life of gaining greater control over indigenous land and resources. So you have to think about the boarding school policy as going hand in hand with the Allotment Act and the policies of the Dawes era to privatize Indian land. These two are inextricably linked together. It's important for Americans to also remember that Indians, um, like African Americans were first taught to read and write in segregated schools and that this system was upheld in the United States until the educational and political reforms of the 1930s began to lean toward public school integration for American Indians. But for a full half century of Indian education, the power of segregation was stubborn, um, uncompromising. Since the publication of Boarding School Seasons, American Indian Families, 1900 to 1940, and that book's been out for over 20 years now, I've continued to puzzle over the history of American Indian education in the United States. Indian education held some 
uh, very distinctive features, while other qualities were shared with other ethnic minorities and even other indigenous people when viewed from a global perspective. What is unique in the US context is that segregation in American Indian education was linked to these land policies um, that the United States continued to, as you know, exploit native lands for the enrichment of its citizens. And so the rhetoric at the time went that education was to be the solution to the so-called Indian problem. Education was to be the compensation that Indian people would receive for their continued dispossession. Now, the federal government wasn't always going around saying, we're going to take more Indian land now here in the assimilation era. But yet the rhetoric focused on, you know, native people needed to be civilized. They could only do this through private ownership of property. It has a magical quality that is going to transform native people and uplift them from their savage state. So um, Indians were promised citizenship of the United States. They were also promised Christianity in exchange. Um, and so you have to uh, kind of remember how important these ideas were that also citizenship, Christianity were also part of the boarding school um, kind of agenda. And policymakers at the time said that this will then allow Indians to finally transcend reservation life, integrate into American society, and begin holding down jobs and working as laborers. And uh, women would be, Native women would be transformed and they would become good wives or domestic laborers. So one of the things I often ask my students in teaching about boarding school history is um, why segregate Indians into this elaborate um, system of off-reservation boarding schools, right? That people went to a great deal of trouble to um, develop this system of Indian schools that followed Carlisle so that um, there were dozens of government boarding schools that eventually existed in, especially in the Western states. And so I often ask my students at the university then, why did the federal government create an elaborate system of off-reservation boarding schools for Indian children? And because they have been reading and trying to understand the rhetoric of the day, their response is inevitably, it was about assimilation. And of course, this is the project most frequently voiced by policymakers and reformers in the 19th century. And then the next, to me, very logical question for discussion in my classroom is, why not then a similar call for Chinese boarding schools or German boarding schools or Italian boarding schools? Because there were many people that, um, that Americans were uh, convinced we needed to kind of um, assimilate into American society. So if assimilation into American life and the English language was the desire and rationale, why then and can assimilation alone account for the presence of Indian boarding schools for over a half century in the history of the United States? So in the late 19th and early 20th century, the reality was that properties and assets were still at stake. So we know that by the time Carlisle is established in 1879, um, in fact, the treaty era is, is kind of coming to an end. I know my own tribe, the Red Lake uh, Band of Ojibwe in Northern Minnesota made a considerable land session in 1863, where we surrendered lands to the United States um, that were west of our present res day reservation in western Minnesota and also into the Dakotas, this prime kind of agricultural land um, that we uh, had formerly controlled up until the 1860s. But that era is sort of coming to an end, um, the treaty era. And so how then, what is the next stage of dispossessing Indians? And of course, this coincides with the boarding school era. 
And even in the aftermath of large treaty negotiation, Native people still held on to considerable real estate in the United States. And so the campaign for Indian land and resources, I often think, was really being waged every single day of the boarding school era. And it's the history of this land grab, the desire for Native lands and real estate, rather than simply the rhetoric of assimilation, this is what initially produced Indian boarding schools. So this is why Carlisle, um, this is why you have the schools, um, you know, the schools that, that we came to know from the Midwest through the Western states. This is when these um, schools were kind of emerged during this era. But yet again, it's an era that lasts about a half century. And by the 1930s, sadly, tragically for Native people, that land grab was coming to an end because millions and millions of acres of land um, passed out of Native ownership in the post allotment years, right? So if you, we think of the Dawes Act of 1887, Carlisle had already been set up. These new government boarding schools were going to be the place where Native people learned new trades and learned to speak English because they were not going to live as tribal people anymore. That was um, kind of the goal of the Indian um, boarding schools. And so it's the story and the history of this land grab um, rather than simply assimilation, right? Because we want to assimilate Germans and Italians and Chinese people. So it's the land Native people hold on to in the late 19th and early 20th century that produced government boarding schools. And then by the 1930s, there had been so much dispossession, right? When the federal government said, this is gonna be the best thing for Indian people. This, um, this uh, uh, the, the, you know, attending government boarding schools and participating in this um, education. But also they had said, the Dawes Act, the allotment of Indian reservations, privatizing Indian land is also going to benefit Indians. Indian people knew that they weren't going to benefit from the allotment of their reservations, but they were compelled to do this in the late 19th and early 20th century. And allotment uh, continued up until the 1930s, until FDR came in as president. Um, I'm from a tribe in northern Minnesota, the Red Lake Ojibwe, that remarkably is one of the few tribes in the United States that did not take part in the allotment process. But I often tell people at home, we were still slated for allotment and the government policy kind of came to an end, but policymakers were still saying, let's get up there and survey the land because we need to also allot Red Lake. But fortunately for us, our, uh, the policy came to an end. Um, in the 1930s, people could see that Native people were doing very, um, very, very poorly, massive social disruption, um, social problems, great poverty, and people could see that Native people did not, um, were not enriched. But most of the land that Native people had uh, in 1879, even after the treaties and when Carlisle was established, passed out of Indian ownership. And the example that I often give is a reservation in Minnesota that was supposed to be the homeland of the Minnesota Ojibwe. The uh, state of Minnesota was trying to consolidate all the Indian people up at White Earth in Northern Minnesota. This happened for um, many Indians, but other Indians managed to hold on to their um, home places. And, but yet this was um, a place that was allotted in the late 19th and early 20th century. And the consequence for the White Earth Ojibwe is they ended up losing over 90% of their land base during the boarding school era, during the post allotment years. And so that is a story of terrible political uh, corruption and impoverishment of native people that has long-term and permanent, has had permanent implications for native people in Minnesota. So 
that's a little bit about the early history and how the policy emerged. But again, as I've con continued to study boarding school history, my single greatest realization has been um, when I, especially when I was working on boarding schools, um, boarding school seasons, I began to understand through the stories that Native people were telling about their family life and their children and their communities, I began to appreciate the remarkably important role of the Great Depression in shaping boarding school history. And so it's kind of after that time that I started to appreciate that some of the differences in Indian experiences, right? And I think as many of us and, and me kind of starting out, how can we have these different stories of boarding schools? And, you know, we hear so many different um, kind of interpretations. But one thing to consider is that these differences in Native experience should be viewed as generational. One reason that boarding school experience varied so widely for American Indian children and youth was that their lives and their ideas were significantly influenced by the time in which they attended school. And so I'm gonna ask you, I know many of you have read um, memoirs, and this is one of the, the things that I looked into as well when I was looking at boarding school history. I was trying to understand folks like Luther Standing Bear um, from the Northern Plains, or Sun Elk, who is from the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico, or Charles Eastman, the Dakota man um, who was born here in Minnesota. I started to think about their boarding school experiences and people like them arriving at places like Carlisle, Haskell, or similar institutions um, arriving there for their haircuts and their uniforms. But it's important to remember that there is something very distinctive about this generation of American Indians, some of whom arrived at Carlisle. And that is that they were people who were um, young people at the time of the Indian Wars. Charles Eastman himself, was his life was completely shaped and shattered by the Dakota War in Minnesota in 1862. And so many of the early um, boarding school students, and I and I mentioned in boarding school season, the, the Apaches, who were essentially prisoners of war of the United States in Florida, that when those people were taken from the American Southwest to Florida to be incarcerated, they were taken as entire families, and their children um, were taken away from them, and they went on to Carlisle, right? So they were the children whose parents were involved often in armed conflict and resistance against the United States government. That was the case for Charles Eastman, whose family fled into Canada after for safety, for their own safety, because it wasn't safe to be in Minnesota if you were a Dakota person after the Dakota War. So they were um, the children of people who were involved in the resistance from um, movement. And, and often their families were, had been engaged in military resistance against the United States. And so think about that generation of people like um, Luther Standing Bear, the Lakota, Charles Eastman, the Dakota man, um, the Apache children who ended up at the um, Carlisle School in the 19th century. In many ways, their life experience was very unique and not entirely shared by later generations, right? So despite the problems that, you know, later generations may have experienced, and I, I guess I look at my grandfather, great-grandfather who went to Carlisle as being, um, he was sort of the World War I generation, even though he didn't go into the war, but he was part of a different generation than Charles Eastman and Sun Elk and Luther Standing Bear, uh, because their experience that those folks who were the children um, during the Indian Wars in the United States, this experience was not entirely shared by later generations. And it's hard for us, and maybe would have even been difficult for my 
grandmother or my great grandfather who had gone to Carlisle to appreciate the experience of that earlier generation who had been, um, you know, there was so much suffering, so much fear. And it was, um, you know, a, a tremendously difficult time for Native people. But in some ways, that experience, as I say, was not shared by later generations. And so we might think then of the Apache children at Carlisle or Luther Standing Bear um, who rode the train to Carlisle at the end of the Indian Wars as um, we must think of them as kind of a, a unique generation in the history of Indian education. Now, subsequent generations of students, many of them had often um, already attended a mission school or a day school before on their own reservation before they went to boarding school. Many of them were bilingual or they were perhaps from families who worked in the wage economy. Makers of a native new world in education, the early Carlisle and Haskell generation, um, many of these people still attended school at the height of the assimilation uh, campaign, but some of them were also at the end of this military conflict. So you see what I'm saying about that early generation who went to um, who went to Carlisle, to me, um, typified by those Apache kids removed from their parents down in Florida. Their parents were prisoners of war when the Apache kids went to Carlisle. It was a hardship um, that was perhaps, even though, you know, how do you compare and measure later hardships, which were truly um, real for people? but there was something extremely, extraordinarily difficult that this generation um, faced. So as I mentioned, I've more recently become quite intrigued by the American Indian generation who lived through World War I and survived the influenza epidemic of 1918-19. This was um, in many ways also a, uh, an exceptional generation. Because I um, looked at, I guess I, I first became interested in the history of the big epidemic of influenza, the global pandemic of 1918-19, which we're right now in the 100th anniversary of, um, because it emerged as such an important story in boarding schools. I could see it in the reports that people were writing to Washington about the children who were ill, um, some of whom died during this global uh, epidemic. And the other thing I want to say about the influenza of 1918-19, which was a big story in the boarding schools, is that this, this particular influenza of 100 years ago was somewhat unique in the history of the modern world in that young people were especially susceptible to it. And so um, it was thousands of Americans, thousands of Canadians died, and many of them were young people in the prime of life. Most of us now think of in an influenza year, an average year, and in fact, this year was not a very bad year for influenza, but we generally think of people who, elderly people and so forth, who actually die, um, the most vulnerable, people who are already sick might die of influenza. But this one was so frightening to people that young people in the prime of their lives died of this particular um, virulent influenza that was a global epidemic. It killed more people than World War I. In other contexts, I'm talking about this epidemic, not just the boarding school part of the story, but to put in a little pitch while I have your attention um, right now, I also believe that the jingle dress dance um, emerged out of this global epidemic. And up on the Mille Lacs Reservation at the um, Tribal Museum there, we've just opened a new exhibit on the, on the jingle dress at 100, acknowledging this history. So the big influenza of 1918-19 was a huge deal for the generation who lived through it. Um, and so, uh, World War I is um, a very important story. I'd also recommend to you the work of one of my uh, colleagues, John Troutman, who is a historian who wrote a wonderful book called Indian Blues, 
American Indians and the Politics of Music, 1879 through 1934. John Troutman suggests that this World War I generation produ produced a different set of tactics and ideas than those promoted by the first Carlisle graduates and the older members of the Society of American Indians. This is a kind of early reform group of native intellectuals that had been formed in the US in 1911. But Troutman studied an interesting and eclectic set of boarding school graduates who became professional musicians in the United States. And Troutman views this group as being, as he says, self-consciously modern American Indians who were creating new traditions while publicly asserting that Indians must claim, quote, a voice and leadership in their own affairs. <clears throat> so the World War I generation was also the first generation of American Indians to um, enlist directly into the military from government boarding schools. And this begins a new trend in what we might think of as Indian patriotism in the United States that many of us are familiar with today. And that um, trend directly relates to the American colonialism inherent in the federal boarding school system. That is, we must keep in mind when we look at our history of native participation in the military that we know has been quite high, um, not just World War I, but especially World War II, we must keep in mind in um, contextualizing that history of um, military participation <clears throat> that volunteer rates were higher from boarding schools than reservations. And what I'm trying to say is that boarding school students and graduates were the most likely to enter the military and fight under the US flag. So regardless of their uh, kind of affinity for the United States. So the changing times of World War I directly influenced the experience of students as well as return students. And many of them employed the language of citizenship to advance Indian rights and cultural pluralism. That is, this generation began to reject the federal bureaucracy's older campaign for cultural assimilation. So when we think about the history of uh, kind of Native Americans finding their political voice, realize there's a long history of this that predates the 1960s or the Red Power Movement of the 1970s. Um, and so, and I, and I think this is why scholars like Troutman find this World War I generation so interesting, is that they began to employ the language of citizenship to advance Indian rights. And so they have their own uh, kind of political agenda. And I always like to recommend, if you're interested in this idea too of the World War I generation, I don't know him myself, but there's a historian whose book I, um, really am a tremendous fan of. And his name is um, Christopher McMillan, and his book is called Making Indian Law. And he tells the story of a particular uh, Native man who came home um, to Arizona after participating in the military, who was really someone who um, kind of uh, questioned the policies that his tribe was facing at that time. And I think of him as being very much one of these um, kind of people who fit the mold of that World War I generation. So I highly recommend um, Christopher McMillan's book, Making Indian Law. Because really, if you think about that era, Native people are struggling for their rights. Um, some of them, you know, not only went to boarding school, they went off to World War I, they saw the world, they came back changed by those experiences. And they didn't really have um, kind of as we do now, lawyers, they didn't have, it was just um, the field of American Indian law was in its, um, you know, just at a very beginning stage of things. Tribes didn't have a legal recourse and way um, to sue 
uh, the federal government when they had complaints about disposition or um, other problems that they had. And so this book kind of takes a really interesting look at the development of the field of American Indian law and talks in particular about the role of that World War I generation. So I'm making a case. We have the children of the Indian Wars and now we have the World War I um, generation. I would also say that a new era in American Indian education commenced once public school education surpassed boarding schools as the foundation of US Indian education. So looking at this from a perspective of government boarding schools, the 1930s is a big era of change in native um, history in the United States. There are native people still in boarding schools, but the federal government is closing down boarding schools at this era. It is not, um, you know, it is not the policy any longer to favor boarding school education for native people. John Collier, uh, FDR, um, Collier's, um, the person who, who was in Indian education in Washington at the time, Carson Ryan, these people were progressive educators and they believed in public school education for American Indians. And so that's why when I look at this era of when boarding school was at its greatest influence on native people's lives in the United States, it's this half century from the establishment of Carlisle up until the 1930s when, board, when public school education takes over as the dominant way that native people are being educated in the United States. And that's very important for us to keep in mind. The smaller number of boarding schools that remained primarily existed to offset the poverty of Indian families during the Great Depression. And this was something that I was puzzled and overwhelmed by when I first myself went in and looked at letters from families, student letters, I didn't understand how the government boarding schools could be flooded with so many letters from families um, asking to enroll their children in government boarding schools in the 1930s. Um, and at first, when I started to, to notice this big trend, I thought, how, you know, how can this be? I thought Native people uh, despise boarding school education for their children, but there are um, countless letters in government repositories from Indian families. And I started to um, try to contextualize those letters. And what I was seeing, and this is something I wrote about a lot in boarding school seasons and why I continue to study boarding school history throughout the 1930s, ending up around 1940, when most policymakers had turned away from it, I saw that Indian poverty during the Great Depression was Indian demand, it's kind of ironic, but native demand for boarding schools was so widespread in the 1930s. And the 1930s was actually the decade of highest enrollment, but it became in the 1930s a form of poverty relief for native families who were suffering, who were unemployed, and who were some of the earliest people to suffer some of the negative consequences of the Great Depression in the 1930s. So anyway, I, um, we're about at 12 minutes too. And so I think I will uh, kind of pause there and Rose, who is um, I think manning the, uh, the emails from people and questions, I guess I'll stop right there and see if there are any questions about my argument about why we should look at boarding school history in terms of generations before I go on to sort of end up on this idea of historical memory. That is how we're remembering boarding school history today. Great. Well, thank you so much, Brenda. 
Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in so far, but I just want to remind everybody that you can and submit a question on the right side of your screen. Um, I'll be kind of taking a look at those and moderating them and um, asking Brenda your questions. So please go ahead and um, continue sending those in. Uh, so the first question we got, Brenda, is about the argument about segregation that you were talking about earlier. Um, and this person asks, why do you think that Indian boarding schools aren't included when we teach about the history of segregation in this country? Mm -hmm. Well, I sort of wonder that myself because I what I'm and I guess what I'm trying to encourage you by all of you who are educators out there and, um, you know, teaching in high schools or teaching in college is to kind of include boarding school history when you're thinking about the history of segregation. It's not exactly the same story, but there also are, um, I know you flashed up there, our book, Brian Klopodek and my book called Indian Subjects. We do try to talk about um, segregation and the lawsuits that emerged from native people when their children were excluded from public schools in the United States. Uh, there was a case in California uh, called Bink Pine. And um, those of you who um, know Paige Rabin's book, Authentic Indians, she talks about another case from Alaska um, when Native uh, families were suing to have their children enter public schools. And so there is a lesser known story of Indian, um, not just segregation, but the desire to attend uh, public schools and legal action that they took, even though it's not um, famous as the stories that we have, but it may be for those of us teaching a good point place to kind of enter in to the conversation on some of these topics that we big topics that we address in the history of American, um, you know, American history, maybe we should be talking about boarding schools. Um, I mean, we could talk about it in terms of the Allotment Act and Indian dispossession, but I think it also fits under this topic of segregation. And when I have a broader audience um, for my work, and sometimes I do when I um, go to talk to major educational um, organizations, I like to enter in that conversation about segregation because there usually are a lot of African-Americans present who have thought deeply about that topic, but don't really include native people either and are thinking about it. And I just, I just wanna encourage everyone to uh, give that some further thought. Great, thank you. As you were talking, we had another person ask um, about the specifics of the lawsuits that you were discussing. I know you briefly mentioned a couple, but I don't know if you want to go into a little bit more detail about some of those lawsuits that kind of yeah. connect to segregation. Um, I guess I would say, you know, those were early. I think I'm trying to remember where I first read about the Big Pine case. It might have been Vine Deloria at some point who said, someone should really study this. This is an interesting topic. And that's um, in the California uh, Native history context. So you can see the, a little bit more about Big Pine in the introduction to Indian subjects. And like I say, Paige Raven does a really beautiful job of talking about Alaska Native history, but I would have to go back and look at that to remember some of the outcomes. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we got one other question. Uh, somebody is wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the connection between boarding schools and the treaty era coming to an end um, and just kind of the connection between those histories. And I know you talked a lot about that in terms of thinking about the moment of land grab, um, but maybe just the that specific moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, you know, historians like to kind of, uh, periodize and we sort of think about things in the in this kind of chronological way. It's not the way the, the rest of the world necessarily thinks of things, but it's it's the way that we're kind of trained to think. So yeah, so the the um you know as I was saying that treaty era is one we know it's kind of the dominant story in relationships between Indian tribes and the United States and that kind of post-Indian removal era. And so you do have major treaties. I know I was just up in Michigan in the Upper Peninsula last week and we were talking about uh, the consequences of their mid-century treaties. So it is a very, uh, you know, kind of complicated time uh, actually, up there, we were talking about not just there were treaties that involved land, there were some that involved 
um, mining, as in the case of um, some terms of the treaties for uh, Native people in Michigan and other areas. So the so it is uh, you know we we think of the land loss as uh, maybe being associated with treaties, but I want to encourage you to kind of think about the the assimil this half century I'm describing when the allotment policy dominated federal policy making towards Indians as being the second big kind of land grab in the history of the United States. And it's in that era that policymakers are shaping this narrative about, well, Native people, um, you know, they're not really going to live as tribal people anymore. They don't really need this land base. And with their transformed lives, they need new job skills, right? So we have to think about boarding schools and land policies altogether, rather than going for believing the rhetoric of well-intentioned folks um, who only want the best interests for Native people. Uh, because when we look at the outcome of that 50-year era, it's a huge era of Native dispossession. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Well, in the interest of time, why don't we move on to the last piece of your talk about historical memory, um, and I'll encourage people to continue sending questions in, and then we'll have some more time for questions at the end. Okay. So the, now, as I've continued to puzzle over um, boarding school history in, in many ways, I started to um, kind of think about how complex this era is and how when I was doing my research as kind of a young graduate student, like I say, my grandparents and some of these folks who had been to boarding school were uh, around for me to consult and talk to, um, I, I heard what they said about boarding schools. My grandmother talked about working as a, um, a domestic servant, um, you know, in, in South Dakota. And, you know, that that kind of, it, it irked me. I was unhappy hearing about her uh, experience, but she didn't complain really about English speaking and these other things because she came home to Red Lake after boarding school and she resumed speaking Ojibwe and participating in the life of the community as she had prior to boarding school. So her experience, um, was very influential. I didn't see her and many of the elders I spoke to at Red Lake as people who were confused about their identity, even though they had gone to um, boarding schools. And so because of her and other people, I started to think about how complex their lives were and how, how devastating that late 19th in early 20th century era was for American Indians. And I think for Indians, our historical memory of the boarding school era is clouded. It is confused and it's impaired by terrible losses for our families and our communities and our cultures. And these are, of course, the disruptive um, processes of what we now call settler colonialism. So the years after 1879 were a time when, if you think about it, Indian people moved to reservations. They were witnessing the environmental destruction of land and resources in the post allotment mayhem. And I often think, you know, we're talking about global climate change here in our world today, but how many of these um, effects began during this big era of native land, you know, grabbing native land and native dispossession. You know, this is the time in the area where I live, where, um, or where I'm from when the big pine forests were cut down. And so native people experienced all that as being um, not just destructive, but destructive to their economies, to their ways of life. And it was a very frightening and, um, insecure time in which they lived. We know that treaty rights were abused at the local level as states began to intrude on tribal sovereignty and in federally issued orders. We know also that native there was religious discrimination and that spiritual practices and other traditions were 
um, were suppressed by the federal government, right? Where we were all supposed to become Christians, even in boarding school. Even with the decline of assimilation in the 1930s, problems continued unabated, especially economic hardship on reservations. The Great Depression was a catastrophe for Indian people already coping with poverty, new diseases, right? So once we got rid of smallpox, it now um, tuberculosis became the big health problem. Cultural practices collapsed under the weight of Christianity. There were also corresponding migrations to towns and cities which had a big impact on native language retention and other social formations. So you have some kids in Indian boarding school no longer speaking their or learning English and no longer speaking their native language. But think about other things like out migrations. Where do people from White Earth go when they've lost over 90% of their land base? So there are other social issues contributing to the loss of our tribal languages as well. But Perhaps most disturbing of all to Native people, these problems um, appeared to be not just a passing thing, but they were appearing to be permanent problems for us. And so the question I want to ask is, I've named a whole lot of terrible things that happened to Native people during what we call the boarding school era. But I'm wondering, is the boarding school era so clouded, so um, clouded by overlapping categories of colonialism, hardship, trauma, and drastic change, that it's unfeasible for Indian people to begin sorting it all out. History is very confusing. Um, so do we sometimes lean on the ready explanation for the social problems that emerged out of this half century? Um, especially when one defining memory is endorsed by so many people. So the article that I wrote that appeared first in um, Brian Kolpatek's and my um, book, Indian Subjects, has now just been republished in the Journal of American Indian Ish Education. Um, the uh, issue that was there that just came out a few months ago. And uh, Chanina Lomawema and others who work on the Journal of Indian Education at Arizona State University wanted to republish it um, to get a wider audience again for the piece because um, it may kind of explain some of the issues about historical uh, memory and how Native people are remembering boarding school history um, today, which may be um, different than in earlier generations. So let me kind of end up too with a, uh, an alternative narrative of boarding school history. And I'm wondering, is, it, is there still room to offer another narrative to what may have become a vastly oversimplified history? That is, our social problems result from boarding school. There was a man from my reservation, Alex Everwind, who went away to government boarding school in the years of the early years of the 20th century. He had very nice parents. He grew up in Panema uh, as um, one of our wonderful communities where the uh, Medewin and the Ojibwe language predominate even today. And he was the only boy in his family with two sisters. When I was a kid in Red Lake growing up, he was an older gentleman at the time, but I remember him. He um, had an older sister who became ill and died before Everwind went away to boarding school. There were a number of students from Panema at Carlisle and Everwind first thought of maybe he should go to Carlisle, but he was sent to the Toma boarding school in Wisconsin when he was a teenager. He arrived in the fall of 1914 with a friend from Panema named Russell Wind, who soon became sick and died after their arrival. Everyone stayed on in the school. He worked in the boiler house and shoveled coal, cleaned out ashes. But in later years, he shared no memories of mistreatment. 
even though the English language predominated. He still spoke Ojibwe as an elder. And everyone said he came home from school twice. Once was when this in the early spring of 1980, when his younger sister, right, he had two sisters, one died before he went to school, and his younger sister, Eliza, died in 1918. Now, this is also the big era, as I've been suggesting, of the flu epidemic. Everyone said he, in, uh, in the 1960s, he told his story, and we have it in our archives at Red Lake. He said he never forgot the day a telegraph arrived at Tomo with the sad news. Later, he would talk about his journey home by train. And he said, I walked, I walked this lake, meaning Red Lake on, on foot, on snow. He walked straight across the lake, the frozen lake to Panema. And he um, ran into his aunt first who invited him into her home. And um, she said, how, uh, he said, how are my folks doing? She said, they're all right. I don't think they knew you were coming home. And so you're going to surprise them a little bit with your arrival. She gave him some food to eat and he went on to his parents' house. And he said, my folks jumped up when I got there, I surprised them. And he said, they said, well, we lost your sister. So Everwind would go on to say how tragic this was, how he, but yet he went back to Toma, completed his program, he went on to the Wapaden boarding school at a time when um, many students were ill and dying from the global epidemic of influenza. So the boarding school is at first glance an ordinary story, Everwind, about a young man and his family struggles. But I wonder, is there a larger significance to his seemingly ordinary story that maybe it tells us something more about human suffering that complicated and further destabilized what Native people were experiencing in these same years because grief seemed to be a relentless presence for them. And so I ask, with all of these social problems coexisting with boarding schools, is the boarding school experience overly remembered? Is it remembered at the expense of other significant events tragedies and practices of settler colonialism that also shaped American Indian people's lives. So I will stop there. And if you wanna hear more about this idea of boarding school as metaphor, you can consult either um, the book Indian Subjects and you'll find it there in one chapter. And also it has been reprinted recently in the Journal of Indian American Indian Education um, 57, issue one from Arizona State University. So thank you very much. And I will be happy to um, hear your comments. Wonderful. Uh, so we've gotten a couple more questions on this last portion. Uh, the first is a question just about recommendations for resources of some of the generational impacts that people still feel of this era today. Um, or even thinking about the way you were talking about how people are trying to kind of sort out this complicated history. If you have any recommendations um, about resources that people can turn to. Yeah, so I'm trying to think of kind of the best. I, I am, a, you know, as I say, I'm a historian. And so I have tried to look at that, um, that era very closely. I'm trying to think of places. So if you look at Indian subjects, that might be a good place to go for further information because there are what we tried to do with that book was to look more hemispherically at the history of indigenous education and so there are essays in there not just about ojibways and people from the upper midwest that i tend to study but we have um, essays in there from noelani goodyear um, who writes about the hawaiian um, schools and the history of indigenous education there. We have Maria Elena Garcia, who writes about, um, you know, uh, Latin America. And on the cover, I love the cover so much of the book because it shows um, Florencia, uh, I'm, I'm going to blank on her name right now, but she and her daughter, but um, she, uh, Flora Palmer, 
I'm getting it all wrong. Floor, F-L-O-R, P-A-L-M-E-R is her name. And she's an educator from Venezuela and she speaks the Wayu language. And she talks in the book about the history of education in Venezuela and indigenous education there. And so, and then Brian Klopodek, um, uh, who did work on federally, tribes that were not federally recognized, has done a really wonderful job of pointing out how, um, how complex boarding school history is, because for his tribe, who were the Choctaws of Louisiana, who were um, some of whom were non-federally recognized, those Indians didn't go to boarding school. And their story is more a struggle for schooling uh, rather than a boarding school narrative. And this is something that Melinda, Melinda Maynard has talked about too for Lumbees and tribes who did not, who lived under Jim Crow, that, that it's more a story of the struggle for equality and education than the boarding school narrative. So it's important to keep in mind that, that we have entire tribes in the United States who fell out of the federal purview and were not, didn't experience boarding schools at all in their history and that it's probably more like 30% of American Indians during this half century I'm talking about that were in boarding schools. Wow, great, thank you. Uh, we got one more question, um, kind of taking us back to your conversation before about generations, but I think it also ties into what you just talked about with boarding schools as a metaphor. And this question is specifically about the compounding effects of um, generations of boarding school survivors. So um, the person wondered, you know, aside from some of these outside factors that you're talking about that influenced uh, how people were experiencing boarding schools, how does the fact that maybe some of these parents or grandparents attended boarding schools impact their experience in boarding schools in future generations? Do you see any sort of um, compounding experiences or the ways that um, people family members' experiences are influencing their boarding school experiences in later generations? I have heard people say, you know, especially when I started out doing some of my work, that their parents had been um, some folks who, who had had parents who were raised in institutions rather than in the Indian community. Mm -hmm. And most of us know that that is not the best way to raise children and that this has an impact on their um, you know, their parenting skills and what they know about parenting if you're raised outside of the native community. So I think that's surely something that has had a, an, an impact on native people's families. When I was doing my work, however, on boarding school seasons, I was reading all these letters from parents talking about their children. And they would say, write to the superintendent. And they say, I think my daughter's losing weight. I remember when a woman from Oneida in Green, around Green Bay, she sent a photograph of her daughter. She said like, this is the fat, happy child I sent you and she's losing weight. And I'm worried you're going to get, she's getting sick and you have to, they were, parents were always writing about fear of tuberculosis. Um, they were always responding to letters. And so what impressed me most about Indian parenting was the determination of parents to stay connected to their children who attended government boarding schools. And probably just like you or me, Rose, if we sent one of our children off to a school, we wouldn't say, ah, they're gone now. Let's, <laughs> you know, they were always writing and communicating about their children mm -hmm. and they displayed a tremendous determination. There were parents, letters from parents who did not write in English. There were lots of uh, Lakota parents on the Northern Plains. I used to see this one particular um, stationery from a garage called the best garage in the Badlands or something was their little motto. And clearly there were some people who came into this garage because the owner wrote English and they didn't, and he would serve as a scribe and they would write mm. to the boarding school that way. So even people who didn't read or speak English sent letters and that was the main mode of communication in those days to stay in touch with their children. So I think when it comes to parenting, we have obviously being raised as some people were, but not all, right, within the institution. 
the death of a mother was the most frequent reason why children went to an off-reservation boarding school. So there were hardships on the reservation at home that sometimes brought kids to boarding school as well. So there were, um, you know, compounded problems for parents, but we at the same time cannot underestimate the strength of American Indian families who survived that era extremely dedicated to the well-being of their children despite the circumstances. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda, for your talk today. It has been very enlightening and informative. We totally agree with you at the Boarding School Healing Coalition about the idea of a complex boarding school history that lends itself to boarding schools as a metaphor for colonization and that when we look at boarding school history we have to take into account multiple things. Um, people's experiences vary vast depending on the time period that they went to boarding school, um, the reservation that they came from, um, boarding school that they attended, uh, as well as many other outside factors. So um, again, thank you for everyone for joining today. Thank you to Dr. Brenda Child for speaking to us and sharing with us today. Uh, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website in the coming months, um, maybe even weeks. Um, and please be sure to join us for our next webinar in the month of May with Dr. Tsunina Loema from the University of Arizona. And thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.